Um, and so for those who aren't from Aotearoa New Zealand, we um, like to open and close these sessions with a karakia, a prayer, which is um, part of the uh, ritual of Te Ao Māori, um, the Indigenous people of New Zealand. So I will start. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te taonga, ki a mākina kina ki uta, ki a mataratara ki tai. E hi akiana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Now hand back to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Abby, for that lovely opening today and welcome to everybody. This is the third webinar in our series around system change um, in Aotearoa. And welcome back for those of us who might have come along this journey with us over the last couple of weeks and welcome to anyone who is joining, joining us for the first time today. Um, we'll have about an hour together. And so just a few sort of technical and, and just the, to share the flow of what we're going to be doing today. Um, obviously, you've come in uh, to a group and so you're on mute, but this will be quite um, participatory. We're hoping to make it a conversation and there'll be an opportunity to go into some breakout rooms later on after I've introduced our um, system change framework for today. We're going to watch a little video and we'll have an opportunity to have a conversation following that. Um, I'd like to introduce just the other facilitators I have with us and we have a guest practitioner uh, today. So Ariel, who is our director in Asia Pacific. Do you want to just say hi, Ariel, so people can see you? Hello, everyone, um, welcome. Um, we have Oriana helping us out with um, all of the tech and the facilitation. And then we also have uh, Lucy Mary, so um, from Cabal, so a New Zealand practitioner with us today who has been using this framework and uh, regenerative practice as part of her work. So did you just want to say hi, Lucy Mary, so people can see you? Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you, everyone. And so um, just to get a sense of who's in the room today, um, I think, Oriana, you have a little poll for us that people can take as we just introduce the session. So if you wanted to just uh, reply who has been here before and um, just... <laughs> Give us a sense of people who are returning to the conversation. Okay, so we can see that a lot of people here are um, joining us for an, another conversation and that's really lovely. So thank you for um, following us along this journey and we'll have the opportunity right at the end today to have a conversation about what might it be like to, to take this further? What, what would our people like to um, engage in next as part of um, system change in Aotearoa? But I'm going to sort of jump in and introduce uh, the framework that we're going to be talking about today. Um, just to situate, so if we, for those of you who, who did join before, in our first webinar, we explored how we can understand change through um, looking at multiple levels and how change is happening um, in a system. We looked at the story of rock and roll, um, but then also how it's situated within wider systems, within what we call landscape level change, and also what's going on on the margins in the edges around technological and social innovation that is actually sort of helping that mainstream system to change and move. And then in the second webinar, we instead of kind of moving out, we deeped much, dived much deeper and we started looking at the iceberg model, which helps us ask questions about what are the deeper patterns, structures and mental models that are underneath some of the events that we see in the world and that help us understand the deeper mechanisms and the way that our um, systems are operating uh, around us and that can give us insight into how we might create more transformational change by really moving down to that deeper level and uh, trying to think about how our actions, whether they're small or everyday, might also start shifting the paradigms and mental models that we are uh, operating with in our societies. And we had a great conversation about how we might go about some of that, what it means to try and create narrative change. And today we're going to tell another story. 
And we're going to focus in on the potential of regenerative development, which is a practice that is sort of emerging and evolving the conversation around sustainability of the world in the world at the moment. And it's really focused on learning from living systems and the way that we can think about life. So um, we're going to play a little video in a minute um, that's going to introduce a story of uh, regenerating uh, water resilience and communities in Mexico City. And I'm particularly excited about this because I've been working directly with these practitioners to um, hear about their work in Mexico and to help um, develop a story that both helps us understand the framework and also really the potency of the work that they've been doing in Mexico. Whereas of course, I haven't been able to talk to Elvis Presley and Rosa Parks for the previous two videos. So this is a, a really nice um, uh, sort of more lively conversation for me. But just to frame that up to start off with, um, I had the opportunity to meet Janine Benyus, who is a, a wonderful thinker who brought the idea of biomimicry in, uh, into the sort of design world in, in the 1980s. And she has this wonderful phrase when she's talking about the way life has evolved over the last 3.8 million years and how we might think and look to nature for some of the design principles um, for sustainability. And she says, life creates conditions conducive to life. And for me, that really encapsulates some of what I'll be talking about today in terms of how, as our vision of sustainability and sustainable futures might bring in this idea that actually as living beings and living societies ourselves, uh, there's so much to learn from the way living systems operate and that can give us keys to aligning our own societies and ways of being and acting in the world with creating conditions that are conducive to all of life on this planet. So that's just a little introduction. And we're going to have a conversation about, you know, what does this story that's very much rooted in these communities in Mexico City, tell us more widely about how we understand living systems and change happening um, in living systems towards creating these conditions conducive to life. So at this point, I'm going to share the video.
So there we go, everyone. This is our story of um, Mexico City and the work that Isla Urbana have been doing in um, the area of Chochomilco. So we'll come back and talk through the story a little bit. But the purpose of this is to introduce a framework that helps us understand how living systems evolve and change and how we might align our own work um, in systems change in a way that um, really makes the most of the potential of these living systems. And so I'm just putting a little quote here, uh, which explains why we would do this. Um, and one of the reasons is that the, the inherent potential of living systems to continue to evolve and change in a living world. And so the key piece here is to say that, you know, when we're using our mechanical mindset, the way of thinking that's been so influenced by European Renaissance and scientific thinking over the last three to 400 years, we get um, sort of stuck in a way of thinking about the world that is breaking things down into parts. We saw this um, in our previous conversations, but that's also really focused on um, depleting and the idea of entropy, that things are kind of going towards decline. Whereas living um, systems are also governed by the other processes of evolution. And so I love this, this phrase that says living systems don't just run down, they grow up. And the key piece that we're looking in here is how can we harness this inherent potential within the possibility of all living systems? And of course, we as humans are living systems ourselves. Um, and so are our communities and our societies. And we're very much nested within the wider biosphere to um, sort of move to new levels of order, differentiation, organization, to continue to evolve in this living world around us. And so the framework that this little video introduces is one called Levels of Paradigm, and which really thinks about what are the different levels on which living systems are operating concurrently, so at the same time, and that helps us understand how the work that we're doing can also operate on these different levels. So what we saw as part of this story is these four different levels operating. Now, obviously, again, here, this is a framework. So we're using it in a way to make uh, complex systems simple enough for us to work with. So, you know, we're not saying that there are only four levels and that it's exactly these things, but I found this a really helpful framework to try and understand what the different ways of operating and thinking are in the work that we're doing. And the key thing that we're trying to think here is that it's not about choosing one over the other. It's about being able to operate in these different ways at the same time. Um, so both thinking about existence, what exists, how do we um, operate, how do we function, how do we do things, and then thinking at the same time about the levels around potential. How are we managing to improve and evolve and continue to build the capacity into the systems we're working with to adapt and change in a living world. So the four levels that we're going to explore today, um, we start from the bottom. So that's around um, that what we call value return. This is really focusing on the self, on efficiency, on doing, on operating. It's the kind of mode I get into when I've just got to prepare supper for my kids and I kind of go into autopilot and you can kind of just go, go and do things, find your ingredients, chop the vegetables, get it happening, you know, just kind of doing things. Then at this same level of existence, still working with what is, we have the level around resilience, which is to maintain effectiveness. And obviously I can't just operate on my own um, as, a, as a living system. I, I operate in relationship to others and that's what means that I can sustain over time. So um, resilience is focusing on that next level out of community and how we need to transact with others um, around us, whether they be uh, people or living creatures and beings in, in order to sort of sustain over time and maintain our effectiveness. But it's still very much in the realm of what we do already. It's about kind of um, keeping up to speed with things. And then there are two sides in the realm of potential. 
there's um, what we call here doing good when we think about it as a sort of paradigm is really what might be an ideal or how do we develop and pursue ideas that actually increase the capacity um, to evolve in the world around us. So this is really about um, improving, um, innovating, sometimes disrupting, creating new ideas um, so that we're adapting to the world that goes around us. And then there's this top level, which we call regenerate life, which is really working from the essence of ourselves as living beings and the families, communities, uh, ecosystems around us as living entities and beings, and really trying to think, well, what is the way that we can enable them to express their own potential and move into the next phase of their evolution? And it's a difficult shift sometimes to try and think of you know our our cities or our um our, our systems the sectors we're working in as living beings and that's really where the shift comes in and thinks about how can all of what we're doing while it's also um getting on with stuff fixing problems creating ideals innovating how can it also be in service of regenerating all of life and we see that these living systems and this is the way that the frameworks been designed um, are nested. So these levels fit within each other and they are interdependent and work together. So I'm just going to talk you through the story again to understand a little bit what we can see through this story about how this project um, in Chotramivko is actually working from all of these levels at the same time. So the first level here, value return. Um, what we see here is installing uh, rainwater harvesting systems on individual houses, which is giving these households self-sufficiency and access to clean water in an area of the city, um, which hasn't had the infrastructure investment that's necessary for people to have um, clean water just coming out of the taps in their houses. So that's very much the doing, the efficiency, focusing on one level, the level of um, um, each household or each person. And that's really key because actually we also need the water. We need to operate on this level to be able to function as beings at all. And at the same time, not just focusing on each individual house buying its rainwater harvest system and installing it, the way that Isla Havana has worked is to create this network of connections across different people in the community and to make sure that there are skills in the community to be able to repair and uh, you know look after and maintain these systems and that um, they're also being able to share water from house to house and this was something that really came to life um, after the earthquake in 2017 that we saw in the video where actually these communities where the big infrastructure systems had been totally broken up by uh, the by the earthquake they had the resilience and the practice of sharing and being able to um, share water out from house to house and actually this very impoverished neighborhood was able to share water and come to the rescue of other people who were in the wider city who also didn't have access to water so this is really about resilience how do we sustain over time and it's focusing on community on interactions between um, entities in the living system and at the same time there's a vision behind this project which is not just about installing rainwater harvesting systems it's innovating a model of how we can work with water and so um, it's not just about Chochumilco, which is this um, extraordinary part of Mexico City, which I was lucky to, to visit, where there are um, canals and it's very much a sort of waterway based system, which is um, which is linked to the history of Mexico City. Uh, but it's really thinking about how do we actually innovate and try out new things on the margins? How do we find a way to um, think differently about water in the city in a way that reduces um, hardship and, and kind of the risk that there is from, from these repetitive earthquakes. And so that's really about thinking how we can improve and involve the water system as a whole at that city level. And at the same time, the way that Isla Urbana has gone about doing this work is through reframing the relationship to water as a core element of the founding identity of the city. 
um, ancient Mexico City was actually founded on a lake. Um, and so water has been absolutely key to all of the stories and the identity of this city for thousands of years. And what the Islaban team were trying to do is not just tell people how to install and maintain pipes and rainwater harvesting, but really think about how these communities can enrich their stories of life through their connection to place and through their connection to water as really an expression of their way of life um, for these thousands of years and connecting back to these ancient stories. And actually what they've noticed is that this is really what has enabled this to take off and to um, have a really high uptake and sustainability level of these water harvesting systems. So obviously they're back at the kind of value return level, they're much more functional, but we've noticed in the, these communities in Mexico City that they have a sort of over time, they're sustaining and maintaining these systems at up to 90% of the households, whereas in other uh, parts of the world where people are including rain harvesting as a way to, you know, give access to clean water, they tend to be more around the 60%. And so we're noticing that actually this working from the essence of the place, this working with community, with their stories, with their cultural history, with their relationship to the living systems around them, also actually has an effect in terms of being able to sustain uh, the work and even the functional levels of the work over time. So this is really, you know, the, the way that we work with this framework, helping us understand how we need to both shift our thinking around what it means to regenerate life, but also connect all of these different levels together and make sure that we're operating not just on the um, you know, functional side of things, not just do good and being ideal and working with sustainable futures, but all of these four levels at the same time. And just so the four levels that we can, not the four levels, sorry, the, the sort of four learnings that I get out of this story is around, you know, living systems are constantly evolving in capacity to the changing world and they have the capacity to regenerate and that makes us think that you know what might our role be as change makers more about enabling that capacity than about um, you know doing things or coming up with projects or solutions that living systems are nested and so value is created through the contribution of a whole system whether that be an individual, a person, or a family, or a community, to the wider system within which they're nested. And so value adding processes between those different levels are the way that we can really shift and change things. That working from potential, so this regenerate life level, um, not problems or possibilities, opens a pathway for sustained systems change. And that noticing and actively adjusting the paradigm we're working from is key to evolving all of our human systems to better align with the living systems that we are interdependent with. And so at this point, before we go into having a little bit of a conversation about what this might mean to us in terms of how we understand change, I wanted to invite uh, Lucy Mary, you have worked with some of these regenerative frameworks and practices and just to sort of ground this for us in an example a bit closer to home in New Zealand. So we would love to hear from you just for a few minutes about what this might have looked like for you in practice. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, and yeah, it's lovely to be here and, and share and connect with you all. So um, yeah, I'm Lucy Mary Mulholland. I work with Cabal, which is a regenerative development company based here in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. Um, and we work with grassroots communities as well up as um, up to large scale corporations and um, Cabal in partnership with Living Futures New Zealand sort of paved the way for Regenesis, bringing the regenerative practitioner series here to Aotearoa about five years ago. Um, and so I've worked with Cabal, um, Caroline Robinson for the um, last two years now. And before that I worked in the field of child and adolescent mental health. So I've always been drawn to this kind of developmental processes, um, first at the individual scale and now at this sort of wider organizational whole place scale, because it's all 
fractal. Um, and so the levels of paradigm framework is something that very much underpins everything that we do in Cabal. And this is um, not just in the work with clients, but in our day-to-day -day running of the company. Um, so from our kind of, you know, our morning check-ins to how we welcome people into the, um, into the team. And occasionally we bring it out explicitly in workshops, um, but more often we're holding it in the background to use it to lift up our thinking when we actually come to design processes and engagements with clients. And um, I, I guess we're always really working to become more aware of um, what are those ingrained and habitual thought patterns um, that might be kind of trapping us down at those lower levels um, that to be kind of aware of those and then lovingly disrupt our own thinking so that we can move up those levels. And if we can do that for ourselves, then we can do that for our clients. Um, and so I guess, you know, we know that thinking is behind all of design and decision making and action. And so being aware of what is actually sourcing our thinking, what paradigm we're operating out of is just so key. And I think this is the power of this framework is to bring that conscious awareness to where our thinking is actually being sourced from. Um, and the beautiful thing about this is this ability um, to actually tap into this regenerate life level thinking is actually innate to all of us. And um, because we're not just sort of working with living systems, we are ourselves living systems that we've got our own experience of our own nature and our own livingness as this kind of source of wisdom and knowledge. And um, this is basically the starting point for us with all of our work. We kind of, um, we're not going in there to sort of convince anyone of anything or try and make them work at a different level or, or look at things from a different perspective. We're really just kind of opening up and um, creating the conditions that enable people to sort of cut through those layers of conditioned thinking and to reconnect with that innate but sometimes slightly unfamiliar way of thinking and experiencing the world and really seeing it as not mechanical but but actually alive so for me it's the kind of difference between watching a video of a dance floor full of people moving to actually stepping onto that floor yourself and experiencing it in all dimensions and there are kind of um different ways we do this so one example is um we uh a couple of years ago we were working in a suburb of Auckland and we were preparing for an integration workshop where we had multiple different stakeholders um coming together and part of our role was to help sort of coalesce and align this group and I remember thinking um you know how is this going to work? <laughs> this is, I was quite new to Cabal at this time and we had different council departments represented. We had local residents. We had Mana Whenua, the um, indigenous people of this land. We had the local board. We had Auckland Transport, Healthy Waters, just so many diverse stakeholders in the room and a housing developer. Um, and I just was a bit freaked out about, you know, how is this all going to come together? And what unfolded though was this conversation that was, was truly collaborative it was it built trust among the group amongst the group it was so productive because there was this sense of the competitiveness and silos just starting to sort of naturally drop away because this realization just sort of emerged that it just made sense to share information to work together to align efforts and it was my kind of first real experience of seeing kind of the magic of this framework at work that, you know, what I expected was going to just turn into sort of a, um, you know, a screaming match of egos and different kind of um, pushing and pulling. It just suddenly became this totally co-creative space. And I think what made the difference was starting with something real. So something alive. And as Laura said, um, you know, place is actually a living being and we're all in service to this place and that that's actually the ultimate unifier. And, uh, Bill Reed from Regenesis always describes this magic moment when you see that your project is not the project, the project is the wider system and your project is in service to that. And uh, it's, it's magic to watch that happen. So instead of starting the session with um, a brainstorm on all the kind of bad things we want to fix in this place, which is that arrest disorder level, um, or just kind of asking what each people, you know, what each person was working on about how to make this place better, which is that do good level. We started actually with the place itself. So the actual whole living system that we're working with and in um, and making it really real and really specific. And so not generic, not static. Um, so we shared the story of the geology of the land. Um, we shared the story um, similar to your story, Laura, of, of the, the, the waterways, the, the watershed of that area, and that there's a stream there that um, the source of it is kind of hidden away in the bush, but it actually runs right through the, the center of the, um, 
the suburb and out into the harbour, which used to be a traditional fishing ground for the Māori people, that this is such a unique um, waterway in that area that's sort of been piped underground. Um, we shared about the way life has evolved here, the different flora and fauna, the movements of people over time. And then we actually invited people in that workshop to sort of add to this collective imaging of the place. And the effect this has is evoking that deep sense of care and will that's actually required to work at the regenerate life level. Um, that, you know, generic, abstract doesn't actually make us excited when something is specific and real and it's actually seeing the potential that's emerging from the unique essence of this living system. That's what actually activates that will and that care in us to actually work at that that paradigm level and I think we're so kind of quick to jump to solutions and ideas but um, that immediately blocks us from just experiencing the livingness of place and actually getting to know it so seeing its patterns understanding what it's becoming and then starting to see how we might play a role in service to that becoming um, and just one other very quick example is um, a workshop that we have with an executive leadership team as part of a wider organizational development program um, where we used a slightly different approach um, to kind of uh, lovingly disrupt the thinking again to sort of see if um, we can tap into that higher level um, so this is kind of based on the belief that in order to be able to experience dynamism change and complexity in our thinking which is what's required for that regenerate life level we first have to experience it in our bodies and it has to feel real for us so as well as using a number of different levels frameworks and organizing frameworks from regenesis and carol sanford in that workshop um, as sort of lenses for thinking into the development of the organization as a nested whole we were also um, working to create the conditions for regenerate life level thinking by creating environment in that workshop where we were conscious like very very conscious of the forces of living systems and the laws of nature all around us so this looked like um, being in a boat club that was actually coming right out over the water and the tide throughout the day flowed in and out so we had a full kind kind of tidal cycle we had right throughout the day this whole flock of seagulls that would land on the roof and then occasionally take off and swoop around and come back again um, we had the sun tracking over the day that we could see the times shifting. We worked with, instead of just kind of having catering, we worked with a woman who um, comes from a local community garden who used food as a way of telling the stories of all the different food families. So she introduced the Amaranth family and, and told, told us stories of where all this food had come from. So to connect us again to place, we used rhythm and sound um, and we used the elements of fire, um, water, air and earth as another way of, again, just tapping into that, that livingness. So, um, yeah, just a few examples there of how we bring that to life. And I'll pass back to you, Laura. Thank you, Lucy Mary. Really lovely to have some examples of, uh, yeah, what this looks like in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but also in, you know, in a workshop setting, in a, in a group setting. Sometimes we sort of get these frameworks and we get engaged with them on our own very conceptually and get all excited about them in a book or in a in a session like this but what does it mean to actually work with them in a group so thanks so much for bringing that to life for us and what we're going to invite you to do now for those of us who you've joined us before is to have an opportunity to actually have a conversation about change and so um, we're going to put you into breakout rooms and you'll have about 10 minutes um, as uh, in random groups. So please do make sure that you make um, enough time to be able to introduce yourselves and, and maybe some of the work you do or, or what you're interested in here, but also a bit of a time to think about um, how do we, um, you know, think about change and what does this mean for us about working with change? So um, I think we should be nearly there with the breakout rooms. I will just stop sharing my screen for now. So welcome back everyone. I hope you had some nice conversations. I know there was a bit of jumping around between rooms as people um, sometimes jump off when we, <laughs> when we put them into the more interactive side. So I hope you managed to have a nice conversation there. I'd love to invite you to just take a minute to think about what were maybe a, a couple of the insights or any questions that you're holding or anything you wanted to share back with this uh, bigger group from those conversations and to pop them in the chat for us so that we can sort of see the different um, 
yeah, the different insights and the questions that you're holding and then uh, speak together and have more of a, an interactive conversation now around this framework or what that sparked for you more widely around systems change. So we'll just quietly sort of give ourselves a minute to, to distill some of that conversation and pop some things in the chat for us. So we're wondering whether anyone has things to share. Um, in the meantime, we also had a couple of questions earlier on in the chat that we didn't get to. So maybe I'll just speak to those and, and please feel free to share a little bit as we go on. So um, one of the first questions, and I think that this was answered from, from Simon was around whether this was a, a Regenesis um, framework. And just to speak to that, I know that Lucy Mary, you, you mentioned Regenesis as well when you were talking about the work you do. Uh, so yes, that's where it comes from and um, that we've developed the, the video with them and, and trying to think about more ways to, to work with uh, you know, creative agencies, artists, video makers to bring some of these system change frameworks to life a little bit more for people, which can sometimes um, feel rather sort of abstract and and, and conceptual. So that's very much the purpose of this Stories of Change series is to also work with uh, the practitioners and the frameworks that they that they have and use. Um, and so that's, that's where that comes from. And there was a question as well around um, whether the project in Mexico was sort of deliberately had a vision of strengthening community connections or was just with that sort of unintended extra benefits. And so, um, yes, from, you know, some working with Delphine, who is leading the Isla Habana team in Mexico City, they've very much been working with this framework and other regenerative practices as part of their project. So I guess this is a difference from a couple of the other stories that we've seen. So, you know, the story of rock and roll, which is um, you know, change that happened, but that wasn't necessarily orchestrated or or designed to the civil rights movement um, with Rosa Parks, where what we saw was that that very much was orchestrated and designed, and it was a movement for social change, but that wasn't necessarily using the iceberg model as a framework in order to uh, to bring about that change to this story, which has really been designed from this framework and the practices. So we're kind of trying to think about how we can create deliberate positive change. And um, thanks for putting in now some, some little questions uh, and um, having a, a view, I guess, into those black boxes, which are the breakout rooms that we didn't join um, and weren't all together. And so uh, lots of uh, questions here around the kind of community um, side of things and how uh, place-based work is, uh, is quite different. Um, and uh, all of the different sort of stakeholders and peoples and issues that are coming into that. And there's also something about how, you know, living systems are uh, universal or um, the, the kind of overall interconnected things here. Um, and the similarity to indigenous approaches and that model resonates and are intuitive uh, for people um, who have a, a different approach to living systems to those of us who have perhaps been brought up in this culture inspired by, you know, very European and Western scientific thinking, as we spoke about last time. Ariel, did you want to speak to some of these things that we're also seeing here in the conversation? Um, sure. I'll, um, I want to share my, I'm going to selfishly share one personal thought, and then I'm going to pull some things out of the chat. In particular, I'm interested in, um, in, in the similarity to an indigenous, indigenous approaches, just to give you a heads up. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the, so what I'm ex I have not used this framework before, and um, and what I'm excited about with it is how you can use it in a crisis, and that it actually that it was used in a crisis, and in uh, a lot of the conversation. Uh, the focus on extreme poverty, um, and that food access to food is going to become the major issue in terms of how do we actually do that and so when the world when you've got people that are going hungry and you want to talk about systems change at the same time i feel like people say you're academic you know you're being an academic you're being theoretical i've got children starving 
Um, and and I, I love that the example because it's around we we don't have water. And I think, in fact, in order to create change, we've got to be able to think at both and to be both looking at how do I make sure that people aren't starving and how do I make sure this is leading to systemic change? And that to me is central to the question of coming out of COVID is that we've had a crisis and we have near term. We have to solve in the media term um, and simultaneously want to leverage this opportunity to create systemic change. So I have not used it yet, but I'm very excited about it for those conversations in the developing countries around Singapore. Um, and then I, I'd like to, grab facilitation mic or, or talking stick. And I just wanted to hear more, um, Nagariki, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but I would love to hear more how you say there's a similarity to the indigenous approaches, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Let's see if she can join us. If she Shut <laughs> I'm actually, I've got a two-year-old in the background, so I'm, that's why I was sort of on mute. And... That's, that's, a, that's a good living, evidence of living systems, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I've got a living example. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's um, a few things, and one is a context of having done a lot of youth work um, where we did a series of wānanga um, a few years ago and then another context is um, I make documentaries and um, and the idea of uh, allowing something to spring from the land um, which is very I mean that was the thing that I really especially listened to Lucy Mary's um, examples a lot of the things that we did in um, the wānanga with the youth. So uh, we, uh, I think there were some people in the last session that I shared some of this with, but basically we um, went to a marae and we spent a few days in wānanga with the whole community. And um, where we started from was um, a choosing a tūpuna um, from that marae, um, as well as the place. And somebody who was from that place began with a story about that tupuna and then we led the youth in a series of workshops where we um they workshopped those stories out in different ways so using movement using creativity we did play because that was something that was a legacy from there and that was all to explore um yeah their relationship to place their relationship to that place so I'm just a bit put on the spot, so I'm not really prepared. But basically, um, it was a it was a massive success. And even years later, you know, we had some of those young people. And the, at the time that we did it, what we thought about was um, what we thought about was it was like planting seeds. You're not necessarily going to be able to see something. We're not going to be able to measure this in three months or six months necessarily. Hopefully six months, but whether that happens in six months, who knows? But it wasn't six months. It was like a year later, and one of the young guys who's now doing really well and he's involved in lots of environmental co-papa. He hadn't had been totally disconnected from the marae. He just happened to come back for it, and he said it was during that one and that something something shifted for him. So that was one kind of having a look at this model is kind of what reminded me of it because we did a lot of like sensory things and just reminding people like this is you like you, you're not this story of this land this river and this mountain and the ocean that's right there that's you that's who you are and that did and that had this like you know a wave of that's... change and the, and the other thing sorry the last thing was just in my practice as a documentary filmmaker working that's... with indigenous communities is um sorry <laughs> Am I, am I running over time? Yeah, it's basically uh, taking, um, letting the land have a voice in the stories when we're making documentaries about environment. Um, the land is a character, so the last documentary I did was about Cody Dieback, and um, we let the trees be a character, we let the mountains be a character, we let the oceans be a character, 
and we let that inspire and inform the documentary and how the narrative unfolded and it led to quite a different result than maybe a traditional form of story storytelling but all of this that I saw in this model is reminded me of these approaches that we've just intuitively been doing anyway so that's why I find this quite inspiring <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Nagariki, and um, I noticed that I think Ariel's having a little bit of internet trouble, so I'll jump back in again just to say thank you. We have um, come to the end of our webinar here, and I wanted to just thank again our, our partners and our um, uh, the conversations that sort of led to this initially and invite anyone who wants to stay on. Um, I know some of you may have commitments, but we're going to have a short conversation around, you know, what next? Is there anything that leads from these conversations? Is there anything that we would like to, um, you know, take forward into our work or into thinking about how do we connect system change practitioners in this part of the world? What kind of capacity building is needed? What we might do together? So if anyone wants to hang on, we're going to to stay on the line and for those of us who need to jump off or who were just here uh, to really enjoy the webinar itself um, we will follow up with um, the slides and a link to the video um, and maybe some other suggestions that come out of this as we go forward so thanks again everybody and we'll just give people um, an opportunity to to drop off after the karakia that Abby you're going to share with us thank you very much Laura so just to close us out, anu here, anu here, anu here, ki te uru tapu nui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, te ngāko, te tīnana, te wairoa, e te ara takata, koiara e rongo, whakairia, ake ki runga, ki a tīna, tīna, hui e, tai ki e. Tai ki e.